The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world of investment choice that goes beyond borders. Open up a world of investment opportunity with NetWealth, where you can access local and international securities, as well as bonds and foreign currency options for wholesale clients. Offer your clients flexibility, transparency, and efficiency with managed accounts, managed funds, and access to non-custodial assets. A world of investment awaits you. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantinus and this week we're diving into our second Advice Tech feature episode where we're going to discuss sort of broader issues and any ideas the industry is facing, you know, what we're dealing with, what we're coming up with as it relates to tech with the absolute promise that next week we'll return to our regular programming and we'll dive into a specific app for you. Now, today's feature topic is this tension between building scale or using automation versus designing amazing experiences for our clients. And who better to have this conversation with than a gentleman who has been an advisor himself, has worked in a dealer group, and in fact, in the last few years, has founded two businesses, not just one business, two businesses, one building websites for financial advisors and the other consulting on all things process improvement and technology solutions. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Patrick Fling. Pleasure to be here. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we were just saying it's been so long since we've actually seen each other. Well, even virtually, it's been far mm. too long, sir. 100%. 100%. Far too long. Two peas in a pod we are. We both think the same way about a lot of things. So before we dive in and start debating things, then let's just get to know you through your use of technology. What's your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? Yes, I use emojis. And I like to consider myself an early adopter of emojis. Really? Um, yes, yes. <laughs> um, however, I do keep it extremely simple. Um, so literally, happy face, sad face. Just if you, um, you know, if you think of uh, you know, just the absolute classics out there, crying face a bit too much, perhaps. Um, yeah, that's about it. Uh, <laughs> it it helps tweak tone. That's what I use it for, and that's yeah. about it. Yeah, awesome. And what about your smartphone? I mean, we just are so addicted to these things, aren't we? We just can't do without them. If you had to wipe everything off your smartphone and just keep three apps, which would you keep? That's a really good question. So uh, one, tragically perhaps, would be Asana. Um, right. So I use that as a task management tool. It's definitely really easy for just shifting things, assigning things, moving things around just as and when I think about them. So I'm not just mm -hmm. making a note, but I'm taking it all the way through to action on my phone. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, perhaps slightly sadly, I do love that. <laughs> I uh, I used to say Twitter for this because I really like Twitter for when uh, I just had, you know, 30 seconds or a minute and I just wanted a little bit of mental floss. Um, yep. However, I've recently transitioned that back to Reddit. Um, because okay. I'm, I'm getting, uh, I was finding I was getting a lot more junk in my feed lately. So I yep. clicked that back to Reddit so that I can just get a little bit of, you know, tech tips or, you know, whatever it is, whatever mood I happen to be in. I get really good filters out of that. Nice. So that's, that's one there. Uh, and then lastly, um, also perhaps tragically is Teams. Um, <laughs> and, uh, naturally I've got, uh, team members that are in different parts of the world at all different times. So mm -hmm. I am finding myself using that, which is something I probably do need to scale back a little bit on, but 
um, I can't help myself at the moment. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Have you signed up for threads? No. Uh, I've, I've avoided everything meta for uh, since inception. I've never yeah. had a proper Facebook account. Um, I, I don't care to start now. Um, yeah, fair enough. Otherwise, if it you're looks not in good. that ecosystem, yeah, and and I'm never yeah. going to be. Um, I am on the wait list for Blue Sky. We'll see. I don't think mm-hmm. I'm famous enough to get there just yet. But you know, maybe after this podcast, I'll maybe I'll, I'll go straight through. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe we both thought, no, I just don't see myself ever being that famous. <laughs> All, All right. So, crossed. we'll get there. Exactly, exactly. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Listeners, you know, talk about us more, please, so we can get more famous. <laughs> That's right. We'll, we need the clout. <laughs> We're relying on you out there, please. <laughs> All right. So, this tension, this tension between automation and, and experience and quality experience, I think, and you actually pointed this out as we were sort of prepping to have this chat, that we probably need to sort of define what we each think automation means because that's probably an important nuance, right? What do you, when you hear the word automation or when you use it, what are you implying or meaning by that? Well, there's the, what most people think of, but when I think of automating, I really think about any way you can improve effectiveness without adding manual input. Yeah, so okay. naturally, it's very easy to call clients more. Um, that's clearly the opposite of automation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but some things you can do that just improve client outcomes and, ma- and they may not even need to be technology-based. They can be literally anything where there's just no human involved to improve that outcome. Yeah, yeah. I'm similar and, in fact, I, I sort of take it a bit further to mean that um, even making the decision to delegate or or outsource is almost on a journey of automation. Like it's a way of thinking that you're starting to think in little pieces and handing off because it's, it's, it's almost always broken when somebody goes from not doing any delegation to fully automating. That almost never works because they're just not used to that sort of handover and structuring things in little tasks. So I sort of see the even outsourcing is like a first step sometimes. Uh-huh. I'm starting to think along those lines. Um, it's not quite automation, but, but I think it's, it's heading in the right direction. It's using the right headspace for sure. Yeah, there's definitely a hierarchy of mm. automation there. Uh, and yes, uh, outsourcing. Uh, is definitely a little bit further down that hierarchy in terms of, you know, you don't want to be outsourcing what you could use technology to fully automate, uh, in a, you know, which tends to be cheaper. But yeah, yeah it's definitely part of that journey and that hierarchy for sure. Yeah, for sure. So then. <laughs> Why don't we? The plan is, I think we can chat about these two sides before we combine them. So, you know, let's talk about, you know, automation and scale and gaining efficiency. What are you, and you clearly, I mean, you guys do this all the time. So, what are you seeing advice practices doing out there that is delivering on that scale or automation front? What are some wins that they're having? Uh, it's a really good question. So I might sort of do the the light version and then the the deep version because mm-hmm. uh, they're they're really at opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, so they're um, using some very narrow, best in class, single purpose tools. Yep. Uh, that might be a scheduler tool like a Calendly or mm-hmm. a Bookings. Um, it might be something. Um, you know, I was looking at a tool a few weeks ago uh, regarding automating how you collate your PDSs to go into an SOA. Really okay. narrow sector or, or purpose-specific items. Um, yep. They're all really um, good ideas and independently they usually can stack up by themselves and you'll get lots mm-hmm. of forward-thinking advices that will just go, oh, yeah, that's a cool little tool. I'll plug that in, save a little bit. That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. And seeing more and more of that, uh, naturally the ensemble uh, group is really great for sharing those little quick win ideas. Mm. Uh, and then, uh, and, and that's all just become so much more accessible, even, you know, in the last three years, um, compared yeah. to the three years prior. Uh, then there's the, the deep stuff. Uh, and then that requires heavy investment. So that's really mm. looking at, um, what I'm seeing predominantly is using existing tech, um, taking a look at that, making sure it's the right tech. And then whatever that, those key elements of your tech stack being, just really investing in the configuration, the functionality that's in there, uh, and all the other little things that that support that. Uh, so yeah. um, when you've got those sort of automations, it's time-consuming to invest in, but 
the benefits of investing in that are now sort of starting to make more more and more sense to people. So little things where some of it is stuff you could have done 20 years ago. Yes. Uh, where it might be you, know, you have an email template for, or so you have a script for when you call a client to book a review meeting. And then if they don't answer the phone, you have an email template to say, hey, we tried to call you and you didn't answer. Whether yeah. that's automated or not, the template's actually the bigger time saving than the <laughs> Than the automatic sending. Yeah. Uh, then you have we tried again, and there's a new email to say, "Hey, we've tried you for a second time." And yep. then there's a third one for maybe the third and final, or maybe it gets escalated to an advisor, and the voice needs to be different. But again, yep. it's another email template and another yep. script, and all those little things are really technology agnostic. But as people are increasingly looking at their tech stack, whatever that happens to be, there's just so much that you can do now. Um, isn't there and it's it's um i mean we get, we've got lots of gold from little things like you're saying it's like picking up all the little flecks and bringing them together to make this whole gold bar of value you know so i mean one of the things we've done and, and i'm now perpetually on the hunt for this is shortcuts or hyperlinks so in your crm we've added a button that takes direct from our crm to our google drive folder for that client so we've bothered to go in and put all those in and that can be a bit manual initially but we've put all that in so now the team can just go straight through to the folder they need you know um all those sort of or a shortcut to um you know within a certain type type of task that's a part of a workflow it's got the shortcut to reference materials that you're always going to need for that thing right or even into your intranet where it's the reminder of what the process is and the things you need to check. Like it's, we're just embedding those shortcuts everywhere. Um, and not only does it get that value in terms of rep repetition, but also it means you can get people up to scratch a lot faster because they don't have to know the, I mean, in the old days, and you are far too young to know this, but in the old days, when you learnt a system, you had to learn the backslash F double two nine backslash this to try and get to the right menu for what you wanted to do. And, we still almost behave a bit like that with systems where you have to learn the, you know, all the drop downs and all the place to find things. I'm like, I'm trying to get rid of all of that, you know, so that it's just intuitive. Um, and, and the, you know, staff can just click through to things because it's right there in front of them, what they need. Yep. Yeah. And, and, uh, it sounds as you're doing one of my little favorite things, which is progressive disclosure. So you've got a high level version of it and. That's all an experienced person would need to be their little reminder. Yeah. But if they're a newer team member or they just haven't done this process or maybe they're an advisor who's trying to self-serve at 6 p.m. on a Thursday night for a meeting that they've got on Friday morning, mm -hmm. uh, then the little bit of extra guidance that you know they're going to need because they're just ridiculously rusty on this stuff. That's yeah, perfect. absolutely. Absolutely. And we've even got, I mean, we're lucky with the serum we have that we can do this, but we were realizing that, um, you know, there's certain fields in a CRM that you don't need very often, but when you do need it, you really need it. So, you know, a new client, a deceased client, like there's these certain things that we're like, God, I wish I found that sooner, you know, and I might have changed my behavior. And so we've got, you know, the banner at the top of the login for that client in our system changes color for just a couple of things. Awesome. So that, you know, when you open it, you're like, oh, oh, clearly new client, you know, like it's, it's that sort of stuff. And it sounds, I know probably to the listener, it sounds like really is that meaningful? It really is. It shortcuts the brain. The team don't need to go and look and check and, oh, I forgot to check or, you know, it's just straight in and you know exactly this is a new client. Okay this is the way I need to behave or this is the thing I need to check or that sort of stuff. So, you know, all those little things can make a huge difference. Oh, it's uh, it's funny. It's a modern version of so many old things where you might have had different colour folders. For Remember? Different, yep. yep. 100%. I have been or around letters on the side. <laughs> Remember like the file systems with all those stickers and the letters and you'd have a different one on it because of the thing. Yeah, absolutely. All trying to just make it to just shortcut thinking that you don't need to repeatedly do, you know, it's just, you can just dive straight in. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's interesting, isn't it? I think for lots of people, they might think they've got to embark on a big system oh. project. And sometimes I wonder whether knocking off a few of these littler wins gets you a bit of a taste, right? They get you, oh, wait a minute. And you can start to save some time. And I think potentially, well, you, and you can tell me whether you agree, you then make better decisions on the big project because you've got a better feel for where value sits and what you're looking for. Uh, ab absolutely. And 
you know, whether you take it as a snowball opportunity and uh, we do this when we're doing our process improvement work all the time. Everybody comes to us and says, I've got no time to do that extra thing that will help me next year at next review <laughs> yeah. this year. I don't have time yeah. for that. So we always have to find uh, you know, a time saver first before we can invest it back. Yeah. Um, and you know, usually we're looking for, you know, we might say we've done a process review, we've been able to save you time at steps one, two, and three. But step four is going to need to be a little bit longer because we want to improve our client experience or something like that. But we just gave you that time um, and more in, in the other time savings. Yeah. So it can be a positive for the snowballing or it can be, like you said, for that realization that, oh, you know what? Investing gave me an ROI. That was really nice. Maybe yeah. I can do that again and get more ROI. Right. And it's interesting. Um Whenever I do any speaking gigs on this stuff, I'm like, Peter, where can I save some time initially? And I just can't go past email. We we spend so much time sitting in our inboxes like it's the master of us. I mean, we we sort of treat our inbox like it's the boss. <laughs> They're the one. And and I, wait a minute, this is a tool that you're meant to be using. You're the boss. You know, we need to behave yep. like it. Stop behaving like you work in the mailroom. This is crazy. And I think some of the wins, if you can get really structured on the way you do it, using filters, all sorts of stuff, then you can free up hours a day. Like it's it's a little horrifying when you start oh, doing that. Um, even even just Outlook rules, you know, yes. it's, a, it's the simplest thing. Everybody's got it. It's right there. And yep. you're just going, you know what, there's this thing that comes in all the time and I want it available when I want it and I don't want it the rest of the time. Yes. Just stick it in a folder. It's the simplest, most basic Outlook rule you could possibly have. Right. And it works a treat. It does. And I mean, there'll be things that we all forward automatically. Like there's a team member that looks after that and we forward it. That's what a rule's for. Yeah. You, d- you don't need a look. Yep. Forward it. Now, you could always tell the team when you get one of these, if you have a question about this, this, and this, come and see me. But you've taken yourself out of the oh. bottleneck, yep. you know, and you don't need to look at it. So I've got to admit, I think, you know, if, if the listeners out there going, yeah, but uh, how am I going to spend telling this stuff? Well, the email rules, whatever it is for your filters, whatever it is for your tool you use for email, please invest some time, watch some YouTube channel mm. stuff and just learn some tricks because I honestly, if it's not an hour a day, I'll be stunned in terms of savings if you get that done well. I do find when you've got a good workflow management system that isn't sending too many notifications, you've configured it appropriately uh, and I, I've written literally a whole blog just on that one topic um, <laughs> of too many notifications. Yeah. But if you've got it right, a lot of the time, you don't need to know everything, but it's great to look back when you want it. Yes. And if it's not an email, which is usually a joke to search, um, you know, the the fact that you can go, hey, I've got something in Asana and it's about you know, updating our FSGs because whatever's changed, there's a bunch of things that two or three different people are, are sourcing. Somebody's getting the new photo for the advisor profile. Somebody's just confirming the details for the qualifications, whatever it might be. Yeah. You don't need to be CC'd on all of that. You just need to be able to look into it. And if you don't like what you see, you want to look, read back, but you yeah. don't want to know all the time. Easy, yes. easy, easy. Yes. And it is, there's a mindset shift there that interestingly, I think for most listeners of their advisors might not fall into this trap quite as much. If you're in corporates, they definitely do where, but I want to know everything that's happening. Uh-huh. So you can't. Um, because if you do, you're not doing your job. <laughs> like yeah. if you're watching what everybody else is doing, you aren't doing what you're meant to be doing. So to your point, just even if you set a little 10-minute you know, meeting for yourself each day where you just go into Asana or whatever it is and just have a look, that is better than letting your email inbox run your day. You know, and it just it's it's crazy making stuff and it's it's a habit we've all accidentally fallen into. Uh and the tool was never built to run our days. It's basically a clever fax machine, you know, like it's not it's not actually a great to do. Like I know that lots of people use it that way and there's structures and complex ways you can do that, but they're not it's not actually designed for that. Um and so we should stop expecting it to. Which brings us me actually to the next sort of hot topic that comes up or I think is going to be coming up more. I know that there's a lot of conversation. Oh, excuse me, listener, for banging my microphone there. Um, Waving of hands, clearly excited. Uh, (laughs) um, But there's a lot of talk about client portals. We're worried about cybersecurity with email and and all valid. Um, 
the thing that's interesting, and I'm curious about what you guys do or what you've helped clients with is, well, we also use email for internal comms, right? There's a lot of emails that go fly around a business between everybody. What are you seeing advice practices doing on that front if they're trying to move off email because of everybody's concerns about the risk that's inherent? Um, So, uh, first of all, internal email is much easier to manage. Um, from a cybersecurity standpoint, you can ensure that anything that's running internal is encrypted and managed in a particular way that will keep yep. it very, very different to what you're sending out to some random server. Yeah. Uh, so that, that definitely doesn't need to have the same level of concern. Um, yep. but, um, you know, it really builds to the point you were making before of, um, it's not just about security. It's also about how you communicate effectively. Mm. Uh, I think. Uh, I think there are some things where you should be sending out notifications, perhaps via email, perhaps, maybe not, it's arguable. <laughs> but then you're directing to, say, a SharePoint where you're saying, hey, this policy has been updated. You can see the update here. Yep. And email is not the best place for that update. That update no. should be something that's there centrally. It's there for current staff. It's there for future staff. It's there for everybody who's away that day. It's there in perpetuity yeah. and you should be directing to those communication tools rather than declaration via email. Yeah. Same goes for whatever your advice-based CRM happens to be. If you're using that internally, you're tracking everything there internally, you're communicating internally there, then the advisor can get hit by a bus. You don't need to have access to their email to be able to see what's going on. It's all there. And if in five years' time there's a complaint, it's very easy where the staff mm. have left the business, whatever your archive rules happen to be, it's all there. And, and these, everybody knows this though. Yeah. Everybody knows they sh- it's that they should be communicating in ways that if it's for a client, is in the advice CRM, if they're trying to run a business and they've got projects, use some sort of project management and task management tool yes. for that. Uh, and the, um, the, the real challenge is the discipline of the change rather than mm. what's the best tech for for that because really like I, you know i love asana but you can use trello you can use monday.com you can right. use a whole bunch you need to play until one one of them you're like whoa that was awesome okay good use that one yeah <laughs> like it's, well, it's just, down to you how you think how you like it's it's actually quite personal the, the task management one i find very true. um and and look i'm i'm with you there i think i mean we use slack uh-huh. internally so we've sort of got an almost zero internal email policy and a lot of the reason for that was because, like you say, there was communications happening in email that weren't happening anywhere else and should. Yep. So, you know, I'm a big fan of handover file notes, you know, things that just – like if there's a thought process in an advisor's head they went through and it's the reason for what they just did, file note that, yep. <laughs> you know, for yourself – because we do jump in and out of things, don't we? It's not like, well, I mean, there might be some people out there that can operate that way, but I just find you never necessarily get to complete a thought and, com- you know, all of the work and all of the things for that and move on to the next one. Often you're jumping in and out of things. The phone will ring, you know, something will happen. You've got a meeting. So if you can get into the habit of just, inter- you know, almost a note to yourself in the system, right, I assess this and, blah, 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 and I want to make sure I check that, 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 next time I do, you know, next time I get onto this file, then it just makes it so quick for you to pick it up again, you uh, know? It, it was funny. I had a experience with one of my clients where uh, we tend to work as an extension of their operations team uh, mm-hmm. and one downside that seemed to come with that after a little while of working together was I was getting CC'd on just about everything. Oh. Yeah, I know, right? I hate <laughs> and, CCs. I hate them. <laughs> and, and it wasn't so much the impact on me that bothered me. It was the impact on each other where I was just thinking, I know what everybody's functions are. I know this place well enough. There's no reason for everybody to be involved in this. Yeah. And you could use a Teams or some or a Slack to actually have some of these conversations publicly and people can opt in to engage. Yeah. yeah. Um, as opposed to I get a I get an interruption. I need to see if it's relevant to me. Once I've assessed it, I need to deal with it, be it respond or be it just ask. Um, yeah. But I said to them, every every time you do this and you send it to somebody who doesn't need to know it, it's at least five dollars worth of interruption. Yeah. So, you know, think of it as if you had a swear jar you know, <laughs> and you've just cost the business 15 bucks in productivity by CCing three people that didn't need to know. Yeah. Um, you do that a lot and it adds all up. of a sudden half of someone's day is just dealing with interruptions that 
break their flow and mean that you're reducing productivity and just literally just reducing the CCs in that case was the win. Um, Correct. Don't Correct. didn't need any new tech. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what um what we found fascinating um with Slack for us. And it this is not for everybody. I mean, Teams can be a similar tool and, and you probably already have it. You may just not be using it. You know, a lot of people that's the case. Um, like you say, having topics that people can decide when they jump in or out. That's actually quite powerful. Um, until you experience it, you might sort of not see why, but it can be really powerful. So that for example, if I'm traveling and I'm on the road, then there's only certain channels I'll even look at because the rest can wait. You know, whereas if I was, if all of that was in email, I would have to wade through them. You know, I'd be sitting at the airport waiting through 400 emails, whereas I can just jump in, address the thing I need to address and jump out because it's, it's via topics. Now, the other thing that's ended up happening, which is interesting for us is, We've got workflows now in Slack that help people like answer certain questions for team members in a structured way or like all these sort of things you can cl- get clever. And also audio messages. Our team love that. Instead of type, 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 you know, they just send a little video or audio message to a team member and it just breaks through, you know, screen share and, oh, I'm trying to do this, man. Can you help me? Um, last time you told me, you know, like we talk about doing that stuff for clients, but you can do it for your teammates too. So it can really make a difference. Um, and as a virtual practice, which we are, it makes that connection more personal too. Um, you know, so it's it's quite powerful. Now that's sort of, and we've only touched on a few things there, folks, but that's like automation, efficiency process. Let's shift now to fantabulous customer experiences, right? And and designing those. I mean, I use the word design. It's only been a little while since we've sort of thought that way in advice, isn't it? Where we thought, okay, we need to actually design what a client goes through as opposed to, oh, here's the advice process. We've been told this by ASIC. Let's do it that way. But what are you seeing? You know, I mean, you guys build web, let's start right at the first point. You guys build websites for advice practices. What are people doing as that first engagement? How are they taking people on a journey from that first moment where somebody interacts with a business? Well, one thing we've definitely seen a shift in over more pronounced in the last 18 months, um, but goes back further than that, uh, is a shift to uh, not just including a little bit of automation here and there, um, but really deepening that engagement before they come and see you. Uh, okay. And we've been getting feedback that a number of our website clients are just very busy from a new business perspective. So uh, one of our clients is in the process of putting their fees on their website, straight up full transparency, and that'll effectively act as a filter. If mm. you're not interested in paying that fee, it's not like we hid it from you and you won't make the call. Yep. Um, uh, we've had uh, a client in the past who's had a filter on their website to say apply to become a client. Uh, and indeed, we use that process effectively ourselves when you request a, a virtual coffee with me on the website. We ask a couple of questions and you would effectively self-filter yourself um, out in that process if, it, if you had perhaps a different understanding of how much work was involved in the sort of support we provide. So yeah, okay. uh, there's a lot you can do there to uh, use those tools, not really as marketing to get more in, but to use them as that first point of contact in your client journey and effectively be a filter, not just a sales device. Mm, um, interesting. That increases your conversions for those that do come through, saves your time spent on non-ideal clients, uh, and uh, you, you can even go deeper with that um, with things like lead magnets and education. Uh, so um, one of our clients does passive investment Mm-hmm. For the most part, not exclusively, but for the most mm-hmm. part. Uh, so when they talk through their education material in their lead magnet, it's very clear that they're not stock stock pickers. Yeah. They, they don't think they're the, the smartest guys in the room, and that's abundantly clear. So if you thought that that was what you were going to get from your financial advisor, you'd probably disengage at that point, and you'd probably go and see somebody else. Yeah. Um, and that sort of thinking and that sort of approach uh, wasn't something that we were seeing so much two, two or three years ago. It was really, we need some brochure wear, get us some brochure wear. We just need to validate that we exist and that we're professionals. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Uh, now your site doesn't need to just exist. It also needs to look current. It also needs to look sharp. It needs to have something that's t- that's dated so that people can tell that you're actually alive. <laughs> um, 
uh, it needs to have things like Google reviews and stuff like that, all stuff to build trust so that the next step is easier rather than just trying to get them to the next step. It's, you know, how do we prepare people for the next step, which is a very yeah. different mindset. It is. And it's, um, I mean, what I'm loving, I've, you know, I do a lot of this and I chat to a lot of advisors and, and I always sort of check out their website and take a look. And it's one thing I know, you know, we're behind, we're behind where I want to be, but I'm loving how many, you know, have got a suite of eBooks or, you know, have a YouTube series that they, they've developed that can answer questions. And like, you know, they're really cottoning onto the fact that, um, you know, where you can, you can take people down a journey. You can, you can help them get started. You can answer some questions. You can, like, there's so much value we can give that I think we used to think was what people should pay for. Um, instead of making them the perfect client who are ready to pay, you know, which is what ebooks and all that stuff does, right? It just really conditions them and helps them self select. It's saving them time too. There's nothing worse than engaging with a specialist in anything and then working out it's going to cost you a hundred grand. Yes. <laughs> you were ready to pay 10 yes. like there's nothing worse right yep. so it's respecting the consumer's time um and you know helping them uh work out if there's a good fit so i love that stuff what else are you seeing you know through the experience or even in ongoing you know retention and engagement are there some interesting stuff you're seeing there that people are starting to add into what they provide so there's definitely an increasing call for some interactive tools to use in meetings Okay, interesting. Uh, so that that too depends on the type of advisor and their approach and their style. Mm. Um, I'm definitely seeing that increasingly so with the more technical advisors who know the number of dollars of value that they can add and they really want to demonstrate that early. Yeah. Um, and so they're looking for more engagement type tools and naturally that's a, a newer style of advisor as opposed to the older school approach that will focus more on rapport rather than demonstration of value. Um, so that's, uh, that's a, I think, a generational shift that we see there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and there are increasingly some cool tools out there that allow you to engage and allow you to demonstrate some value in those meetings. Um, I'm not saying one approach is necessarily better than the other, um, but it's definitely a trend. Yeah. Uh, and then the um, one thing will be, it's, a, it's definitely a hot topic is around the data collection phase. Yeah, okay. And that's a, that's a challenging one because it yeah. really ties into that client. That's experience. getting into the tension thing of, of efficiency versus experience. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, and in fact, let's hold that one because I think we can dive into that as the first example of where, wow, it can go wrong. Because um, I think the other thing I did want to touch on is what I'm seeing on the experience sort of side is, you know, Client webinars, like doing a whole lot more one to many sort of content and letting people dive into that. It happened during COVID, but a lot of us are holding on to that still, and clients are really loving it. And in fact, in our practice, we use it as a test balloon for things. So oh, we're, we're thinking about doing this. We'll flag it in the webinar and see how they react. Yeah. You know, so it's a really great way to, to sort of test concepts out, which I like. I'm seeing people doing seminars again. Like I'm starting to see people sort of do that in person events too. So the whole connecting. Um, one to many, even, you know, online challenges and you know, getting people to take action and, you know, that sort of stuff. So I think there's some creativity happening um, now that we've sort of gone through some pretty significant shifts in the way we've got to do things. So it's sort of exciting in that sense. But let's dive into this example. Oh, I love. I, I got to jump in one, oh, one, yes. one quick one there. Um, there is an element of everything old is new again. Um, yes. And one trend, if we sort of dial back 10 years and if I look at a presentation I would have presented 10 years ago, um, it would have been people can Google everything and after they Google they have a pretty high confidence that it's right. Yeah. Um, And one trend that sort of happened over the last 10 years, um, this is not my term, I heard it from uh, somebody else and I loved it, uh, is the enshittification of the internet. (laughs) I thought you'd like it. (laughs) And, and that is you go so to, eloquent. It's so eloquent, but you know what? It actually <laughs> captures it, right? You go yeah. to Google, you used to not have three ads at the top that you had to work past. You yeah. go straight to the results. Yeah. There used to be less keyword heavy content that was really just built around SEO and it was really just mm-hmm. a competition for SEO as opposed to genuine authority. Yeah. Um, so you'd be more likely to get the right answer at the top of the first page without having to fight the system and go around. Dig through what it's trying to give you. Um, okay. You actually got better 
effectiveness 10 years ago. Now, there's other things that have gotten better, but you used to be able to get to the right answer quicker. Mm. Now, you, you'll get 10 different opinions, you know, you know, more likely to get 10 different opinions, um, and it'll be harder to get to them, and it's a, that battle for SEO that gets out on top. Uh, yeah. And as a result, people got less trust with that self-sourced information. Um, and so the value that you can bring by demonstrating that you're there in person or building rapport over a webinar um, mm. has has more value than it's had for a long time, which I think is uh, exciting because it opens up a lot of opportunities for advice. And the audio, whether it's video or audio, but them hearing you speak, I can't tell you how powerful that is. And it's not until you experience, like you do a lot of it and experience it. So I now that when this episode, I think is number 50 of the Advice Tech, um, Ensemble Advice Tech podcast, I get advisors or support staff, all sorts of people, people even in BDMs and others that I've never met come running up to me at industry, Peter, like, I have never met this human being before, mm. but they're excited to see me. They want to talk to me. They want to engage. It's all positive. It's got a great vibe. That only happens. That wouldn't happen if I was blogging. You know, it's a different communication that that in their ear or video or like you say, live, it's just a, it's a connection that gets deeper a lot faster. You can still do it with blogs. Of course you can, but but there's just a difference, you know, and I and the people that, that take advantage of that for, you know, future clients and engaging that way, I think probably find that their onboarding is a lot smoother, you know, yeah. because somebody's already bought in. They've they've listened to you, they've heard you, they've seen you. Like it's it's so powerful. Um, it's something that I'd even underrated how powerful it was. I, I know one firm they uh, we did their website, we've integrated a podcast into their website and their average meetings went from roughly uh, new business meetings went roughly from 2.5 down to 1.5 because mm -hmm. the clients come in and they already trust the person at the other end yeah. and really it's a question of how do your how does your work apply to me as opposed to convince me that you're where I should invest through or, or and these through. like those are big differences in terms of time, like cost for <laughs> delivering a service, like it's massive, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's powerful. Now, let's get into this. Ooh, the, uh, the old collecting data, the old fact find. It's something that – so we all get why. We all get why we're trying to use tech for that or we're trying to automate it. Or Now, the, the, the challenge I – I'm, I'm going to confess up front, folks. The challenge I have with some of this stuff is it turns – it can turn into outsourcing to our clients. <laughs> like, uh -huh. wow, that's shitty and difficult. We'll get the client to do that. So they spend all this time filling in information, loading stuff up. And I'm sure you've seen that too, where it's just they've, yes, they've applied tech. Yes, they've updated their process. Yes, it looks efficient from the advisor's end, but actually it's just shitty from the client's end. And it's a perfect example of that tension between efficiency and client experience. Have you seen that in play? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, so uh, I, I once did a, a big fact find review project. Uh, and in doing so, I got some family members to complete a fact find. And I just said, I'm just a fly on the wall. I just want to watch you complete it. Uh, at the 45 minute mark, I had to exit because they were starting to dispute. Uh, the um, uh, one partner was saying, how come you still haven't chased up your old employer about your super? I thought you said this was sorted and they were literally having a domestic and I just had to exit. Oops, um, sorry, got to go. Yeah, <laughs> it's like I think I have all the feedback I need about this process. This has been very useful, thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that put me telling. off self-entry. Um, well, right, that's telling. Yeah, 100%. And, um, you know, the... It, it's frustrating for everybody naturally because you just see the double entry. And for some fields, naturally, an email is an email, a phone number is a phone number, a home address is a home address. Um, then you've got the more complicated ones um, around things like budgets and yeah. th you know, where you know, there's an emotional context to a budget. There's an emotional context to clients don't know what their budget is. Is they don't, right. they don't know what they spend. Right. So to put that in a form to say, you know, I don't really know and I'm confronted to even think about it is a challenging experience. Mm. Um, there's I don't know where my super is. And then there's also advisors, uh, fact finds out there that will ask questions that 
we don't even want clients to answer <laughs> um, because we wouldn't accept their answer anyways. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I'll never have a tool to go any deeper on super rather than roughly how much and where do I send the 30 third party authority? Right. Um, why would I ask them for anything else? Yeah. If compliance came around and took a look at it, they'd go, you just accepted what the client said. I'm sorry, Mr. Advisor, that's not good enough. Well, and they're just so bad at it. Like if they guess that stuff, they're so wrong. That over and under. Yeah. Like it's and it's natural. We don't think about that stuff all the time. No. You know, it's natural that it's like that. And I, I was um I was I think I was listening to a podcast actually, and it wasn't about advice, but it was a similar uh client experience where you had to collect a lot of information. And and the gentleman that I was listening to made this good point. He's like, just because you can collect it all at all at once doesn't mean you should. Mm. And I think we get, oh, but it's all the data. Look, we've put it all in one 40-page form. Yes. Aren't we clever? Like it's potentially the dumbest thing we can do. Like it's potentially the worst way from an experienced perspective. And to your point, I mean, I think I could have an advice, like an intro conversation with a potential new client without knowing any numbers yet. Like what brought you here? What was the trigger? What was the thing that made you think, I really need to make an appointment with it? <laughs> like what? There's so many things that are the human elements that will then also help build trust such that they're, oh, okay, I will answer that or, or I'll provide you that or the third party authority. You know, like it's, there's so much you can cover in a conversation without just making them completely financially naked <laughs> and filling in this back pine, you know? So it's, it's, um, it's an interesting thing to sort of map out over time of that first encounter with clients or those, you know, the maybe an onboarding experience or first advice and think about what well, could we delay collecting that? Like when could we do that? Could that be later? Could we get it a different way? Could we, you know, it's an interesting sort of exercise to run through to get a bit creative on that and clients will thank you for it, I think. Uh, that, that ties into a concept I refer to as the trust canyon mm -hmm. where you have a canyon if you graphed out uh, how much effort you ask a client to put in and how much value you deliver and the time delay between those things. Yeah. So there's typically a time delay between when we ask clients to do stuff and when we deliver some actual value for the off the back of that. So if we don't need their ID until quite late in the process when we'll have you know, hopefully delivered some value to them so far, then it's better to defer those sorts of questions. And if we can bring forward any value, then that's great too. Um, yeah. And just close that gap because the, the reason why I call it the trust can canyon is the gap is dependent on trust. Mm. You use your, your trust credit to say, put in all of this effort. It's going to take 45 minutes and maybe you'll have a domestic with your partner along the way, but put in all this effort, meet with me, trust me, part with all this information, get financially naked. And don't worry, in three to four weeks, I'll deliver a recommendation to you, not an implemented outcome but a recommendation to you in that time frame yeah um, and that that requires trust that yeah you're going to do all of that now you can in the same time frame you could have probably bought a house you could have gotten married <laughs> uh you could have taken out a loan for a million bucks but you can't get advice on a hundred thousand um yeah. in that time frame so yeah. you know there, there's a lot of trust in 2023 that that requires um and bundling a whole bunch of things into one point is a concern Unless that really is what your client process is about. If you yep. really want, if your advice vision is, I want to be the most accessible advisor, 100%, it's going to be, uh, we are the lowest cost advisor for what you get. Um, yep. But it is, we, we do ask you to do proper homework. Um, or right. you come up with some innovative ways to do it uh, to get them there, such as a, we'll have a six part workshop series. You're effectively doing your own cash flow advice through there. Yep. You're doing your education through there, and then by the end of that, we, you know, the client's ready to hand over all their data, or they've used a tool that means that you can just walk straight. It's in one place, or it's yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's certainly um, one of the things I've tried out that was an interesting thing, where summarising back to them their situation. So not advice; it's literally almost an engaging and interesting fact find, you know. Like, but it's summarising that back actually had value. Like that was something that they were like, well, that yeah, we would have paid for that, you know, and it's like, okay, well, hold on. As part of this bouncy ball process, we can insert these things that seem to us like it's not advice, but they really like, oh, that was great. We'd never got that picture before, you know, never got that insight. So I do think, 
you know, we've got to put ourselves in their shoes. I mean, I see this stuff all over the place. And one of the things I'm starting to notice actually is where automation or tech or efficiency has been focused on and people, the business or the government department, whatever it is, hasn't thought about what happens when it works well. So when it attracts loads of people, right? So so they go, oh, no, this works really well. So the Opal card here in Sydney, so that's what we tap on and off public transport now, right? And I live quite close to the light rail, which is so convenient and easy and we love it a lot. And you can just tap on and off. I mean, it's just there's no waiting in line and I'm going to buy a ticket and you miss the train. Yeah, no, that's rubbish. It's awesome. Except when everybody in Leichhardt is getting on the same light rail and off and you're trying to get off and, and tap to you let them know that you've got off the light rail and you're all standing around one little pole, skinny pole, with a little dial like the size, you know, of a coaster and we're all trying to tap off and it takes you like 15 minutes for you to leave the light rail station. I'm like, guys, you got so you, – you made the experience so wonderful on a one-person experience. You didn't think about what would happen when you get inundated, right? You just no. didn't think it through. Taylor Swift tickets, right? Ticket tech or whoever that was didn't think about, well, it, when, you know, with these type of concept, when it goes nuts, do we need a ballot system? Do we need it? Like, is there something else we've got to add to this so that the entire country of parents aren't off work, trying to sit with multiple devices, trying to buy tickets for their kids, you know? So it's, there's some interesting examples. I think we probably all need to watch, um, even maybe for the practices that are getting busy, like these, these challenges they're facing with a lot of interest. What's going to happen if you suddenly get a wave of 30 people that log into that thing, right? Or, or try to book appointments. Have you considered putting constrictions on how, how quickly they can book them or like all sorts of things, like think through what if it works? (laughs) <laughs> which often we don't, right? We just think through one. Yeah, I think in terms of the, um, in terms of how that works for an advice on boarding experience, and especially when you're thinking about it from, a, I just want to automate some stuff. Yeah, it's really all of these things sound better in theory than they do in practice, mm. which ties to what you're saying. So if it's a case of, um, you know, well, how much data would a client put in a fact find that we would just take? And data enter. And, you know, some of those things might not belong in your CRM because they're point in time data points, like yeah. what your leave balance is. Yeah. Um, some of those things might be, um, uh, stuff that it's great that the client's done it, but you don't trust what the client's done. Or you're going to have to overwrite that data because they've just estimated something or they don't even understand their own finances and you need yeah. to do the investigation. So how much time are you actually saving when you're going, you know what? I can trust that client data, holus bolus. Mm. Uh, and then if we manage that effectively, really how much value to the business is there in terms of putting it back onto the client? Now, that there might be very little value from a data entry standpoint, especially if you've got a bit of offshoring in your mix, um, yep. you know, reducing that cost of data entry even further still. Um, mm. you know, the, the value to the business might be relatively low. Now, there's something to be said for giving the advisor more information going into an appointment. Right. Um, and that's where we, we generally take an approach of choice being an efficient option, mm-hmm. um, but not mandated work. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm an introvert and I want my meeting to be as short as possible. Mm-hmm. And I will spend the time to pre fill anything so that I have, so that I don't have to talk to a human any more than I need to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, not everybody's like me. <laughs> no, um, no. But it is an interesting. Um, people look at outsourcing and, and automation, and and probably underrate sometimes. You can just throw bodies at it. You know, like sometimes, and um, we've had this with like data tidying up data because it's just not quite right, and it's like offshoring with some resources and just throw some bodies at it. And it seems like it's this big thing, and it is. But getting it right, and once it's tidy, it's like it was worth manually doing that. That was that was valuable. I would have had to spend a lot of money in time trying to get something that would tidy up data in a you know in a machine or a system sometimes just get a body to do this you know just make it a less expensive body you know yeah that, that that's quite right so you got to look at you know what what really is the value for doing this what is the best way to do it yes it might be worthwhile or it might seem like a really good idea to do it this way but um yes you could just throw a body at it mm. when especially when you've got offshore as an option. If you've got a little yeah. bit of offshore already, it's naturally a lot easier to scale that up 
yeah. rather than starting from scratch. From scratch, for sure, for sure. Now let's talk us through some some, and I just came up with some areas, and some of them are not going to be popular in the advice space yet or maybe ever, but I thought it was an interesting debate for us to have. Uh Um, They're things that can add value both on efficiency and from experience, um, but could potentially go wrong. And I'm just curious on our, each of our views of these and, you know, whether ultimately at the end of it, you like each one of them, Hey, are we giving it a thumbs up or we're like, "Hmm, maybe not, maybe this is a bad idea. The first one was, you know, really empowering Uh, consumers or your future customers with self-service resources. So they're online resources. They might even be chatbots. What's your take on that sort of, that sort of tech? So building a little bit on what I was saying there, I love choice where people have choice. Um, And my uh, focus is generally on keeping it really simple and really easy to use. Um, Chatbots specifically um, have some unique context in advice. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't typically have a lot of stuff that a chatbot would be able to really help with. It's not like uh, an ANZ chatbot that could say, hey, what do I need to open up a deposit account? Oh, well, here's the three steps that you have to do. Happy to help you. You We we don't have those sorts of things. Um, There there might be a narrow range of things that we could have for a chatbot to intelligently auto-respond to. and then if we start getting into, you know, what a chat GPT for enabled chatbot might be able to achieve, mm. um, in advice, we've naturally got those regulations where we need to know what that thing is saying. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it adds a very significant um, risk there that would yes. likely be unpalatable. So I would have to give it a thumbs down right now. Ooh, like it, like <laughs> it. Well, for me, I think the power of – this type of tool is what you've got behind it. So if you've got an explanatory video on how to fill in that nominated beneficiary form or like so those when people get stuff sent to them and there's like bugger, I can't quite work this out, then I could see a chatbot might be and they're doing it at 11 p.m., (laughs) which is not out of the realm of possibility, um, then I could see a chatbot being powerful if you have the – thing that walks them through the thing they're trying to do Correct. behind it. And I think that's the issue is we see often chatbots that are just those one line answers. And I, I agree mm. with you. I don't think we have that stuff very much in advice, but I do think, I think on the admin side, there could be some creative use for it. Um, it may not be a public chatbot as much as maybe in your client portal, for uh-huh. example. So it might be sort of living in there, but I, I think, but you'd have to have built You'd have to have known what your frequently asked questions are. What are the things that the team always have to walk people through, or what you know that sort of stuff? And you could build those answers first, and then use something like that that could just out of hours sort of answers potentially. Um, there's some intelligent knowledge base tools that will do parts of that. Yeah. So if you've got a good knowledge base, you've built some mostly evergreen content in there. It can become a really valuable resource for when clients engage. Yeah. And then you ask clients to lodge their queries through there. And then it'll say, perhaps you're looking oh. for these three things down yeah. the side. Maybe yeah. they're right and the client never makes the submission. Maybe they're completely yeah. off and the client's not interfered with on their way to making that contact with you. So yes. As long as that can be done in a secured context, which is key, um, yeah. then you naturally sending some queries off or, or solving that solution, uh, solving that problem for that client at 11 o'clock on, at, on a given night. Yeah. Um, I know for some people, they'll actually want the phone call though. Yes. So it does. It depends on your, on what value that has. And I, I'm with you too. You've got to give people choice. So if they just can't, I mean, if they're not the type that would watch a video to solve that problem, then you always need to have the, Hey, do you, you know, do you want somebody to, you know, either somebody to call you back in the morning or even, hey, grab a time. Mm. Here's a calendar link. Get in now. You know you're going to get the call at that time. You know, so letting people do that out of hours so that they've – because they they want to know you're on it mm. and taking action. So so certainly these things on their own I think never work. You know, it's one of those things that I think needs to be embedded in the other – the other way you interact. So, yeah, I'm probably a, a middling, like a maybe. Like I think it's, a, you know, proceed with caution thumb. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. maybe it's a sideways slump for me for that one because <laughs> I think it just it needs some mm, nuance, I think, to make it work. So that 
The second one is live chat. So, you know, it's it's business hours um, and you have, say, a live chat function to handle things on the website. I'm assuming your response would be similar in terms of security and, and concerns that, that that can be handled well. Is that is that what you figure for that type of tool? Yeah, uh, look, I think that can be handled relatively well um, given the risk attached to that contact is probably relatively low. Yeah. Um, you know, as long as it doesn't, sorry, especially if it doesn't look like they're speaking with an advisor now um, yes. and making that point clear, yes, even if it point. is the advisor who's logged into the app, um, yep. making that being the brand app as opposed to an AR. Yes. Um, you know, ideally, it's a support person whose photo is there so that they're bonding with somebody who's really at the other end, which is genuine and true. Yes. Um, but they're just, there's no, there's no potential of confusion that they're an AR um, yeah. is ideal. Uh, but I, I'm actually a thumbs up. Um, yeah, it demonstrates okay, nice. that you're accessible. Um, uh, I don't like it when they ping automatically and things like that and they feel <laughs> like they're a little bit, you know, no one's really there. Um, All the time. No, no, no. Yeah. Or, <laughs> you don't or, believe it. Or no one sent me a message right now when I happen to be on the website. Right. Um, but having it there as an option I think is totally fine. Uh, and you can get you can get it so that you can have an app on your phone that will ping it so that if you want to have extended hours, um, then it'll, you can. it'll still work. Um, it, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, and it's an interesting, um, you know, for those listeners that are dealing with high volume of queries in terms of new potential clients, um, you know, you could end up having, using something like this, you could end up having somebody that is sitting on a tool like this and can be handling six different conversations at once because they're interacting with different ones. And if it's that early stage and you want them to qualify clients or anything like that, this type of tool can mean that that there is a bit of conversation that can happen before it gets escalated to a call, even if it's not with an advisor initially, it could be with somebody else. But I do think, yeah, there's we're probably not using them enough. I reckon this is a thumbs up for me, this one. I know we don't have it yet and I, I keep on thinking, I actually think this could add some value. I think this could could really help people get some easy answers, feel engaged with, um, but also be easy to use for the team um, to interact. Uh, I agree. I think it's definitely at the margins. I don't think it's yeah. a huge win, but yeah. it does make you presenters ready and available and alive. Yeah, yes. So the, the, the next one we've got here is um, the way I've described it is sort of show and tell, meaning using videos as in recorded videos and screen sharing things on videos and stuff like that to better engage with either prospects or clients. I think, you know, there are going to be some queries that you just can't either type whether it's via email or any other type or even on the phone sort of sucks. Like, oh, it's, you know, maybe they're trying to log in. This happens all the time with some of our clients on a particular platform. They really struggle to log into the platform. Like, like okay, go to the right, you know, top right and click on that blue button and then like it's just, it's a disaster. <laughs> so sometimes that sort of screen sharing and and being able to show them what you want them to do, you know, those sort of things, even if it's pre-recorded, can make a huge difference. Do, are you seeing that being used much um, by advice practices? Not nearly as much as it should be. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, yeah, there'll be a million possible hang-ups that will cause advisors not to do it, um, but it, it's definitely an easy win. So if you've got any way to provide a hyperlink to that content relatively easily, something that's not visible on your website so that you, know, you can't uh, give implied advice or a pr implied product endorsement. Mm. Um, there, there are still ways that you can make that very easy to access so that any time a client calls and they say, hey, I, I can't do this, um, then you can just say, great, rather than me stepping it through to, with you over the phone, I'm going to send you a link to a video that will do a better job than I could anyways. Uh, if that doesn't work, then call me. Yeah, for sure. And I think, yeah, I've, I give this one, one a thumbs up too. And in fact, there are some clients, so we've encountered some who you like watching a video while doing something, you know, on, like that's a bit of a challenge. And so for them, we've actually used Tango, which um, you can be, so you're recording yourself, you open Tango, you start doing something and it's taking screenshots of each step 
and it's almost creating a PDF of the steps you took. And it, to me, it's like a halfway, like it's, <laughs> it's better than you trying to type that thing, but, oh. but it's for people who sort of can't, can't quite, maybe a bit older, can't quite handle the watch the video and like, it's all a bit too fast and difficult. And so then they've got the PDF. They could even print it out if they wanted to, you know, and okay, step one, you know, so Tango I've found quite powerful for that too. So yeah, I'm with you. This is a thumbs up and I agree. We don't use it enough and we have, our teams, our at support teams have repetitive conversations on this stuff that they could just happily send somebody a link. Um, the person might not even have to call in. Imagine, you know, maybe you've sent a pack to somebody for some things to do and you send a follow-up email with a link with instructions on this stuff just in case you have any trouble. Yes. Right? Like preempt the problem. Um, and once again, you're adding value. I, I have a concept uh, that I use when I come into a business that's really backlogged. Uh, which happens all too often. Uh, and uh, you, you end up getting this uh, vicious cycle of client expectations where um, you've gotten an email, you sat on it for four days, now your response needs to be a real darn good response because you didn't give them a quick response. Right. Uh, and you, you're feeling like you're writing to the, the delay as opposed to what the client probably could have gotten out of you if you responded same day you yep. could have said quick answer is you should probably do this um but if that doesn't work for you just give me a call yeah and the client would have been very happy because it was prompt and it doesn't need to be the perfect response because you got heaps of bonus points for a prompt response yes same goes with video if not doubly so client sends you something through go hey i'm just going to do a quick video for you um you know just a rough cut. I'm just going to click around on my screen. It won't be perfect, but it should cover everything that you need. If this doesn't solve it, let me know and I'm happy to step you through it over the phone one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Click, 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 click. It's as easy as that. I know it, doesn't seem, it didn't seem that complicated. Um, hopefully, you, you've got everything you need. Call me if you don't. That doesn't take long. It, you get a lot of uh, points for being prompt and being thorough. Mm. Uh, and, you know, the clients are going to love it and they're going to feel like you cared. Um, but if you sit on it for, oh, boy, I can, you know, maybe maybe if I, you know, clear my Friday afternoon, I can create the perfect video to create that answer. <laughs> yeah. um, it's never going to happen. And then you won't no. have replied until Monday. Yeah. Um, and then you'll yeah. be back in that vicious cycle. So yeah. I would be have, the, have a basic setup. You don't need the world's best mic. You don't need mm -hmm. the world's best camera. Probably what comes free with your laptop will do. Uh, yep. And just do it quickly as if that they were in the office and you were showing them at your screen in the office. It doesn't need to be any sharper than that. Do it quickly and they'll love it. And if you've got a really good process going down the track, maybe you can say, hey, I've got these 30 videos that I've just done as quick videos, quick wins for people. Can you just recreate what I've done but put all the polish on it and stuff like yes. that? Um, yes. Do that as an ongoing project, take your time. And you've yes. done your training video and your scoping video at the same time as solving a client need on the day. Yes, yes, absolutely. And it's um, annual of bring, practicing the video thing. You're just doing it more. And it's it's such a good solution, but people, you're right, do avoid it. And it, it's it's really unnecessary. It's so powerful. And it's no different to you talking to them in a meeting. Like It's it's no different. So relax, just talk like you would. And if you mess up the thing, gosh, that's not where I meant to click, click to the next thing. Like it's just, you know, get some, get it relaxed and just get them done. And like you say, you'll start to collect them and realize you've done 30 in the last month of that one thing. Hmm, maybe we should do that a bit better. It's a great way to narrow down which ones you should, you should, like you say, tidy up. So I'm with you. I think this is a big thumbs up. This one, we could probably do lots more of it. Now, the next one is something that, Look, it comes up a lot in innovation events, you know, when there's these conferences and you get very smart people talking about all the things we should be doing and we need a holistic data view and it's all about the data and, and, you know, having that and, and they're right. So, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not suggesting they're wrong. Um, but I think what we probably don't ever talk about is why this is important. And one of the things for me that this can add real value is I don't think many of us notice how long we spend trying to find stuff. So you'll start on a client and you're, you're trying to dig out that information and it's not in that thing, it's in this other thing. And then like that 
searching and gathering, I call it, can take up huge amounts. Like the stats say it's upward from 15% of everybody's day. It can be as high as a third of just searching and gathering. And so that means you're not interacting with the client, you know, so that's got to be a drop in, you know, customer experience. So, you know, it's not just inefficient, it's really sort of bad for experience, you know. So I'm curious your take on the things we can do to sort of bring and it's not just data, it's context of that client. It's personalization, like all the ways we can sort of use all the different views we have in a client and get access to it easily so that we can just make that sort of process and experience better. That is a complicated one. <laughs> uh, the um, Look, I completely agree. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the things that we do when we start with a business is we'll survey their users and we'll ask them a about a dozen tricky questions of where would you go to find this? And we'll see how consistent those answers are. And then we'll also ask how successful would you typically be when you do try that thing? And if there's anything where we're getting, you know, uh, anything under 80% um, for, you know, 80% of difference across the team uh, and they're they're successful less than 80% of the time is a pretty big red flag Mm. that we don't have clarity over our structure. Yeah, um, and and that really is the first thing of just everybody should know this is how we do it, this is where we save it, this is what we're expecting to see there, etc. Um, and and that that flags that really quickly. Some of that stuff about keeping that up to date uh, can be very technology dependent to see the mm. tools that you've got to keep that mm. uh, fresh. Uh, we typically build. Um, automated checks at the pre-review, post-implement and post-implementation stages. And we'll also typically build tools that will monitor a database on an ongoing manner um, so that if there's d- data misentry on a Monday, somebody's going to find out about it on the Tuesday so yep. that that stuff is kept fresh. Um, and yep. we'll, we've got a few dozen rule sets where it'll go, you know, this when this data point and that data point say different things, that can't be right. It doesn't make any sense. Flag it. Mm. Um, and they're the sorts of things that really do feel like quite a lot of investment. And that's because they are, because keeping data up to date continuously is hard. Yeah. But the flip side is, like you said, that 15% a day of just everything's where it's meant to be. And I run <laughs> a report and the data's accurate. Really is hard to understate how valuable that mm. is to be able to have a client phone call. You pull up the file and you trust what's there. Um, yeah. while they're on the phone. It's huge. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that, look, there, there, isn't, there isn't an easy win to that. Um, one of the things that um, we'll often talk about in terms of that is having an 18-month view on that yep. sort of stuff yep. where you can build some of the tools that I've mentioned and that can be really good places to start. But really, if you're thinking about, hey, I'm doing review prep, how do I need to do this right this year so that this will be easier next year? Mm. Um, if you do that right and you've got good systems and tech, that might be time neutral this year. You're just doing it the smart way rather than the dumb yes. way. Or it might be 5% more time this year. Yeah. But it's going to be it's going 80% to less time next year. Mm. Um, and, you know, if you can spare that little 5% or we can find some other efficiency to give you that 5% somehow, um, worst case, throw a body at it, like you said, although that's yeah. genuinely worst case. Um, <laughs> then, you know, having that 18 month view, um, is vital to be able to get that stuff right. And, and it is an investment. It's true. And it's, a, it's, it is an interesting point because there are a number of things that whether it's requ- legislative requirements that change or, you know, like remembering, you know, when we were first doing FDS and all these sort of things, um, Whenever we approach those things, one of the questions I always sort of ask myself and the team is, do we need to do this as one whole database hit or are we spreading it over 12 months? You know, everybody gets interacted with over the 12 months. So are we? could we just schedule it that way so that we know at the end we'll have done everybody? Like, is that going to work? And sometimes that's just less of an impost and in fact gives you an opportunity to throw a few extra things to check yep. in as part of that process. And it just doesn't shut the whole practice down, yeah. um, you know, so we've certainly approached that. The other thing I'd say that, and this won't work for everybody, but it did significantly transform the way the team could fight. So this is documents. So this is document storage. 
so historically, so for, you know, those of us who haven't used online storage um, are old enough to have remember, you know, servers and things like that, then, you know, the whole subfolder game was quite intense. So, you know, and there's the top hierarchy and then a, the subfolder and the subfolder, and you could end up going through these threads of like 26 subfolders, right? And the poor new person who had no earthly clue where to find things and needed to know all the secrets, right? And so one of the good things is now searching for stuff is a lot easier because you can literally sort of type in what you're looking for and, and generally your your tool, um, whether it's Microsoft or Google Drive or whatever, Dropbox, whatever you're using, generally will make that easier for you. But the thing we realized was when we're looking for things um, in, you know, that client's fold folder, whatever that expression, generally it's event specific. So it's the most recent review or it's the most recent query or it's the, so we now, if you open the client's folder, they're actually, you know, date ordered event folders. And then under that event is everything. So even the advisors things versus the admins, they're all under the event. And we just found that meant handover amongst the team was so much cleaner because uh, it was just in the one spot. Um, there wasn't the, oh, I've got to go up there and I've found that up and then down here. And well, where do the advisors put it again? I don't know. Where do they put their thing? You know, like it just changed that our place and their place that can happen in Teams. And so that it matches our CRM too. So our CRM looks at things that way. It looks at events and then notes and things sit under events. And so we just we just found that was a massive shift um, that just saved everybody's sanity. And, um, and then it's funny, you know, building back to that automation topic, you know, if you're saving, you know, you spend 15% of your day looking for stuff, you can reduce that down to 5% of your day looking for stuff. That's a 10% saving of the whole team per day. That's everybody per day. That's way more than you're going to get out of connecting a tool A to tool B. Yes, I agree. I agree. We try and get really fancy. It's like, you don't need to. Yeah, or, or <laughs> Just the, do the, some of this other stuff and you'll have like, woohoo, massive wins, you know. Yeah, that, that, that's properly phase three and yep. your phase one has so much work to get done before then. Um, yes, 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 yes. So I think we're a big thumbs up for both of us f- for that. Now, this last one, before we sort of wrap up, this is interesting. So customer feedback. Now, I know there's a lot of people probably now focusing a lot on testimonials. So that's certainly something. And I know you've written articles and Google reviews and things like that. But there's another layer of that that's sort of asking continually through the process what's working or what's not. What's your take on what's happening at the moment with that and the opportunity to sort of be getting insight into how it feels for the consumer and potentially improving that experience? Uh, well, for starters, the, to cover to the um, Google review, sort of take it one small step before that, um, you can only ask a client for feedback once really um, you can't say great i'd like a written testimonial i'm going to film you as well and can you also leave a google review and go to advisor ratings as well um <laughs> you know yeah and you move the customer will be like i won't do any of those things it, yeah. <laughs> exactly so you, you can only ask for one thing at one time um the um for most businesses i would be prioritizing google reviews mm-hmm. um because that's the one that's going to pay the biggest dividend back to you yep. um I have uh, one um, one website, an advice website I came across. I've tried to reach out to them. They haven't responded. Um, they have two Google reviews. They've clearly never set themselves up for Google reviews. One person just proactively reviewed them as five stars with no comment, and one person reviewed them as one star with a scathing, scathing indictment of the business. Mm. They're probably just saying, yeah, you know what, the um, yeah, new business is really tough these days. I don't know what's going on. Because they just won't check. Yeah. Um, and to ensure yourself against that, if you've got 20 positives because you've tried to engage clients for Google reviews, then you can't have that because they'll just be a lone voice in the crowd and they'll actually increase the trust in your review rather than decreasing it. Um, so I, I always want to start there. If you get that through to your website, it's got their little profile pics, it's got their names and it's trusted. Mm. Um, so it, uh, SEO aside, and the SEO is great too. Um, But that's since you can only ask for one thing at a time, really, um, I would start with that and I would run that for a program for all new business clients ongoing and I would run that for your review clients, your ongoing clients or your periodic clients 
for 12 months until you've asked them once each. Yeah, okay. Once you've finished a program where you've pretty much asked everybody to leave a Google review, whether they've left one or not, you've asked them at least once. Mm -hmm. Then you get to your next year program where you might go, cool, at the end of review, we're just going to give them an opportunity to give us really short and sharp bits of feedback um, just on how we're going right now. Um, and then that can just be a simple hyperlink to a form that's hosted on your website um, and shouldn't take them longer than a couple of minutes to complete. And you do that at the end of your review process. So it's live. It's not an annual survey. Mm -hmm. I don't mind an annual survey, but if you can get that live survey, you're going to get better quality feedback from people um, and more then more meaningful. likely to complete that feedback because yep. they just finished working with you on something. So your response rates yep. will go, be more than double easily. Yeah. Um, so th that's sort of the way I approach that problem is sort of an 18 month again mm -hmm. sort of program of, get through this, then flip it to uh, a non-Google review type process. Yep. Um, and that can be really cool. The little things like at the end of each uh, response where you can give a thumbs up or a thumbs down or something, you've had a this go. I think that's great in a call center context or if you're working mm. in a really high volume context. I don't mm. really like it for advice relationships. I feel mm -hmm. it makes it feel more transactional than it ought to yep. be. Yep. Um, but that is just my opinion when it comes to that. Um, the, you know, there would be a little bit of horses for courses for that one, but absolutely everybody should be capturing Google reviews and should be getting that live review, uh, after review once they've had their crack at Google. Yeah. I think, um, and so I completely agree. We, and we haven't yet got that sorted. It's something that's on our project list for our brainstorm. We're having a couple of weeks, um, just to make it part of the process and make it easy for us to remember to request it, you know, and so, um, because like you say, we're all in this cycle of seeing people on this schedule review. So why the, why the hell aren't we just making a part of that? Um, but one of the things that I noticed is, um, you know, feedback can form, well, can perform a number of functions. It can literally give you insight, which is great. Um, but it can also remind them of why they liked it. So we found that with our webinars. So at the end now we have a little poll that pops up and, hey, you know, what did you like or dislike? Well, how did you rate it? You know, and and we found that when we did that, the then follow-up emails we were getting us, getting thanking us for the, the doing the webinar increased. And it's just interesting. It's reminding people how they felt about it. Like, did, did you find this? Oh, I did. Oh, well, I should tell you then. You know, like it's so interesting that it's just about um, prompting people to self-evaluate you know, and just sort of look at, oh, yeah, actually, that was really good. I, I I think also, and I'm planning to do this with our, even with the Google reviews, is, is give people some sample questions. Like if you're not sure what you want to say, just answer this question, That's you nice. know, and, and sort of giving them a way to make it easier because it is, it's it, it's a bit awkward, you know, to, well, they're really good and I love them a lot, you know, like <laughs> It's not particularly helpful either. I mean, I use um, testimonials or reviews of restaurants almost exclusively. Like there's very few places I'll go without checking that sort of thing. Um, and I'm not interested in the it's the best place ever. You know, I'm interested in the we had this and, oh, my goodness, it blew my, my, our mind because of, of, and, you know, you know, Craig served us and, geez, he was nice. And, like, I want that. You know, I want to understand the experience. And so I think sometimes the way you position those things is important to to help them remember or to draw out what they really, you know, enjoyed about it, not just the fact that they enjoyed it. Um, uh, we, we like, uh, to that point, we like to give them a back door as when we build our standard process. So it will be, please click here. It's, we have a little button and you go click. Um, but if you'd prefer to provide, um, more detailed feedback or feedback that includes your personal financial details, then please click here to provide a, a, a private, private feedback something to that effect. Um, and then that'll again go to a survey that's on the website. If they don't have a Google account, it gives them an outlet to provide the positive feedback. Or if they want to say, actually, I really wasn't happy. I don't think my this account was handled that well, then they can do that, give that private. They, they've got a avenue for that personal financial for doing details mm. to go through in a safe space. Yeah, because, I mean, the, the, the absolute truth is you can't fix something you don't know about. You know, so we've got to be asking this stuff. Um, or and, double down on what's rocking that you don't know. Yes, yes, <laughs> I completely agree. Like nobody's listening to those webinars. They don't like them. Oh, no, they really do. <laughs> so we should keep doing those. I completely agree. Or something small that you didn't realise was making an impact. 
Mm, and potentially a big impact. Um, uh, the, uh, I, I know one practice that would bake, uh, bake muffins. Um, and, you know, if that's where that feedback's coming through and people saying, you know, boy, we love walking into the smell of warm muffins. You know, you might have thought it was a bit of a gimmick. You might have thought it was a bit, a bit nice. But if you get that feedback coming through, then you might be even more powerful than you thought. Or it might yes. be the opposite. You don't yes. know. Yes. Yes. And look, there's nothing wrong with a gimmick if it works. 100%. You know, like, you know, <laughs> we've got to use whatever we can. It's got all the flips and dispensers and things. And right. It didn't need them. No, no, but it's absolutely, I completely agree with you. Well, Look, we've covered loads in this conversation um, and thank you for sticking with us, listeners. It's been a bit of a longer one, but I think, you know, we've sort of really, I really wanted to dive in these concepts as opposed to just the tech to solve them because I think actually the concepts are the harder part, this this tension. And so is there anything we sort of missed or you want to leave everybody with as a thought to to get them diving down that sort of rabbit hole? Uh, well, I suppose when I think about automation in particular, when I'm sort of thinking about anything that I can do that'll make things more effective without um, having a human do the job, the, there's a lot, you know, and it really is a big deep dive. But if you get to some of those concepts of really thinking about, well, how much time are we saving um, and thinking about data security as you're going, because every time you introduce a new tool, you also introduce a new point of risk. Um, what, mm. How does this impact the client experience? Are we trying to solve our problems with this or are we trying to solve the client's problems with this? Um, they're all real things that you should be deeply considering, not just at a surface level, but really thinking about before you pursue a particular type of automation. And I mm. love automation, um, mm. but they're, they're really primary principles first. Yeah. Um, you start with that client experience first and then go, great, now let's take a look at all the things that we can do from there. Um, and there are some shortcuts you can do, some things where, you know what, you might not need tech, you just make stuff look prettier and sharper and actually think about the words that you're saying a bit more than you have. Yep. That's effectively automation. doesn't add any more time, um, but you get a better outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be um, uh, it can be simple as, you know, what will give clients the choice to self-serve yep. um, but never force it upon them. Yep. Um, so, you know, we, we still call to book an appointment perhaps, but when they, we don't get through, then we send them the scheduling link. Yep. Um, as an option, call back and we'll book it or use this link. Yep. And they've got the choice now. You, you tried the, the maximum friendliness option, um, yep. but it just didn't work. So you give them yep. that chance um, or rather choice. Um, yep. So there's lots of things that you can do there that don't necessarily have to impact client experience. Um, and I'd be very loath to impact client experience with automation. Mm. Um, and the... Um, and you really have to test those things out. Um, you really got to test them deeply, not you doing it, but live cases with real people. So, yeah. you know, get the equivalent of your brother and sister-in-law, as, as <laughs> was the case for me, um, and, you know, see if that ends up in a domestic at the end. Yeah. Um, you know, see, see how they find it with their level of financial education, their yeah. complete lack of context that you would have. Yep. Um, their tech savviness because maybe they don't work in front of a computer all day every day. Maybe mm. they don't have a pre-existing Google account or Microsoft account or whatever the case might be yeah. um, and just literally watch them suffer through the worst bits of what you're considering doing um, yeah. because if you don't do that, you'll never know um, and you'll, you probably won't roll out the worst process. You'll probably pilot it and then you'll find it's been... Uh, a waste of time to so try to identify those sorts of things really early. Yeah, yeah, before they cause chaos, absolutely. So if somebody's been listening going, mm, I think we need Pat's help, uh, what? how should they reach out? What should they do? What are the some ways that they can sort of engage further with what you can do for them? Uh, so first up, you can get a whole bunch of free advice at patrickflynn.info. We've got a blog mm -hmm. on there. Uh, at the moment, we publish stuff there twice a month. Mm -hmm. So you can find something there that that's typically suits your fancy mm -hmm. um, uh, and you can subscribe there as well. And that's a really good way to just get some straight up free tips on how to run an efficient advice practice. Awesome. Uh, we've also got a little spot where you can book a virtual coffee on there. So you can by all means schedule a time with me there or always on LinkedIn. You can just reach out to me. It's just Patrick Flynn on LinkedIn. Uh, there's, there's not too many of me on there, so you should be fine. 
Um, uh, so yeah, uh, multiple ways to get get in touch, but that website is patrickflynn.info, which is usually the uh, uh, the place where you'll have the most of your fingertips. Perfect. All right, Advice Explorers, um, if you'd like to find any more of those details, of course, they'll be in on, in the episode show notes like we always promise, um, along with Pat's LinkedIn details. So they'll all be in there so you can check it out there. Thank you, sir, for joining me here today so that we can really talk through this sort of natural tension between wonderful tech and automation and the consumer experience. I think um, that'll have helped get people really thinking about it so they'll look at it almost consumer first, right? put yourself in their shoes first, and then we can all get magic with the technology. So I really appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us. No, it's lots of fun. Take care. So I'm hoping that conversation was valuable. I know it was longer than our normal episodes, um, and I really appreciate you sticking with us. Um, but, yeah, I'm hoping that sort of debate and us sort of considering things through that way gave you some insight into your own view. So the thing with these feature episodes for me and really any of the episodes on the Advice Tech Podcast is to help you form your own view. The last thing I want to do is tell you what your view is. Um, I don't think that's helpful, but I, I want to help you think through or even give you frameworks that will help you get to your conclusions on things, your conclusions on live chat or chatbot, any of these things. You can, because of the debate, say somebody like Pat and I have, then you can come to your own conclusions. Something I did want to plant some seeds on in terms of the way to think about some of this stuff, these are sort of more high-level concepts, is the difference between a service and experience and a transformation. And, you know, years ago, it was all about customer service. And that was about meeting a particular need. You know, a client has a query or a thing they need done and you respond and you get it done. We're providing great service, right? Which is good. Experience then is all about how that feels, the interaction, how easy or difficult it is, where it sits in the other things that you're doing for them and is the journey that they get to take in that that moment or within that series. Then that might be a piece of advice and, and so the experience is the advice experience and what do they do and what are the meanings and all the elements and all the feelings that go with that. So that's the second stage. The third stage, which is sort of the ninja level of looking at these things, is transformation. And that is a collection of experiences that takes a customer or a, or a client from where they are when they first come to you to where they might be in a year, in two years, in three years. And that could be a collection of experiences they go through and they they transform you know, they change their behavior, their outcome, what they can do, what they can achieve, what they believe, their confidence. Uh, so it's it's almost like you bolt together some experiences such that they go on this journey and this arc of transformation. So those sort of layers are really important because a lot of what we were talking about today was sat in that experience focus. It's a lot more about emotion and feeling and how it feels to do it and what does it trigger and, you know, all those sort of things. Whereas a service really is, is a function, you know, and, and I think, you know, that one of the great things you can do is start thinking well belong beyond the function because that's where that's where efficiency focus and cost focus sits is in the function. Once you start focusing on experience, you'll get past that quickly. And if you start to think about where those experiences sit in the bigger transformation for your client, um, that's when it gets quite magical. Um, I'm early on in that journey myself. I'm not saying this is an expert. This is all of the research and digging I'm doing at the moment, the reading I'm doing. So I'm just, I encourage you to sort of think a little differently, you know, and challenge yourself to look at it that way for the way that you interact with your clients and prospects. Now, next week, we will be back to interview an advice tech provider and provide you with another Curiosity Corner tip, I promise. However, if there is a topic you'd love me to cover as one of these feature episodes or somebody you'd like me to pick their brain, you know, that's sort of vaguely technology linked, um, then please either reach out to me on LinkedIn or reach out to me on the Ensemble community platform. I'd love to hear. Um, what what things you'd love to um, hear a conversation on. And in fact, we're going to start including the speak pipe link in the episode show notes, which means you can click on that link and leave me a little voice message if there's something that you'd love to hear more about or a conversation you'd love me to have with somebody. Um, I'm more than happy to do it. Uh, well, 
That's all we've got for this week. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice, tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And if you'd like a speaker at your next event or maybe for a webinar for your group, then uh, there's a popular keynote I've been doing that's getting a lot of interest at the moment that's sort of tech overload to tech delight, you know, and this is helping financial advisors sort of navigate the digital maze. Um, That might fit well for your audience, maybe even a workshop that follows up that to dive in and learn practical techniques to continually innovate in, in advice practices. You know, if any of that piques your interest, then please reach out to me on LinkedIn forward slash Peter MD, P-E-I-T-A-M-D. I'd love to have a chat. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious. Stay curious.